So it does tell us the search has to be reasonable. Number two, you need a warrant. No, it doesn't say you need a warrant. Absolutely not. Oh, but it, says, it, says, it says and no warrants shall issue but, right. upon, but upon probable There's cause. A, yeah, so people, but it, people think it's implicit in there. No, it is not implicit. I know, but, but why it is people, not do think, I don't care what they think. Yeah, you don't care. It's okay. not implicit. The only thing, the only a reference to warrants in the Fourth Amendment is to place restrictions on warrants. There is nothing to say that there's nothing to say that you have to have a warrant ever. So, so I hope you like that clip of Judge Posner. Really, this guy is like a triple threat. It's like run pass, and he catches passes coming out of the out of the backfield because he is he is a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals federal judge. He has been doing that for about 35 years. We are taping this uh, taping this interview in his chambers on the 27th floor of 219 South Dearborn in the Loop in Chicago, in the Dirksen Building, I guess it's called. So in addition to being a judge for almost all of that time, for all of that time, he's been a senior lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School. So he is an academic as well as being a judge. He has cranked out 2,200 or so opinions, I think, is what they call 3,200. 3,200? <laughs> yeah. I missed that. A thousand opinions I just missed. 3,200 opinions. There you killed a thousand there, of my opinions. There you go. We brought them back. <laughs> so, well, you can remedy these things. That's what courts of appeals are for, right, <laughs> to get things right. 3,200 opinions, uh, written more than 40 books. We were just talking before the show. We're not sure how many. Uh, I think it's estimated at 300 articles and book reviews. So you got a judge here, you got a academic member, and you got an author. So that's that's the triple threat. And here's a guy. It's really amazing. Most people, because he's done so much in economics, they would think surely he's a trained economist and surely you have a PhD. Talking just before, essentially, no courses, no formal courses in economics. So you are a renaissance man, you know law, you know economics, and you're telling everybody they should go out and really if they did history, they should learn about social sciences. If they did social sciences, they should pick up the humanities. If they want to be a good lawyer, is that right? Should they Depending always... Depending on top of, type of lawyer they want to be. Uh... Especially if you're a litigator, trial lawyer? Uh, yes, because they're... Uh... What you say, your your ability to speak fluently, um, to react to unpredictable statements by a witness, or by your opponent, or by the judge. Um, yeah, puts a there's a there's a high premium on uh, speech, articulateness, and so on. So we're here today primarily, but not exclusively, to discuss your most recent book. Give people see if we can get a shot of that. Divergent Paths, the Academy and the Judiciary. Runs about 400 pages, including yes. perhaps yeah. appendices. Um, would you say this is the, your most important book? Pardon? Is this your most important book? <laughs> Do you have favorites? Uh, are your Not books really. like kids and you might have favorites? You want to love all your kids equally, but some a little bit more than others? Uh, I, I don't, I don't you think, don't have really think of books? those terms. Read on. Yeah. Well, it is an important book. I guess you could say all your books are important, but look, it's important as I see it. Um, well, people talk about the law all the time. You know, it's terrible if you're at a cocktail party, if you're a lawyer and somebody says, I'm not a lawyer, but, and then you just <laughs> cringe about what you're about to do. <laughs> you, thought, oh, you want to turn to them and say, okay, if you're not a lawyer, just don't say anything. Okay? All right, but seriously, so law is an important part of our lives. We see it on TV all the time. We see L.A. law, Chicago law, we, law and order, etc. cetera. Um, so people have a sense of the law. They have a sense of law schools and the academic world. And the nub of your book, the nub of your book about these divergent paths, how are they diverging in 45 seconds? Um, the, the, the law schools 
although they're you know, they have they have very high class faculties and are um, very selective in the students they take. I don't think they're providing the kind of legal education that's optimal for a wide range of uh, legal activities. Being a trial lawyer, being a judge, um, being a government official, dealing with uh, legal issues. There are a lot of jobs for which you need information and build skills that are not well trained in by law schools. Isn't it always saying the law schools are not giving are not preparing, at least in the fields of litigation and trial advocacy, the students as well as they could. That's correct. And is it part of it you you sort of in your book I guess part of your indictment of the law schools is they're too abstract, especially their articles are written seemingly you're saying by one professor for, for another. another. Exactly. Not for the yes. judges, not for yeah. the practitioners. Yeah. Uh, they're so abstract, most of those yeah. folks couldn't understand it. Well, one thing that's happened is that uh, the law schools have expanded. There are more law schools, there are more law professors. There are so many law professors now that they have an adequate audience just among law professors. They don't have to have a larger audience. They don't have to worry about <clears throat> whether practicing lawyers are interested in what they do, judges are interested in what they do. So, and you talk about the PhD deification, the fetishness these folks have with words, with maybe too many words, things that they could say simply, they say in a complex yes. way. In that, so if they were doing it for, if they were to turn, you know, if, if you were able to persuade your colleagues at the University of Chicago Law School to be more attuned to the needs of the judiciary and of the students going into litigation and trial advocacy, what would you say? What would you tell them to do? How would they change? Well, the simplest way to change would be to hire a significant number of law professors out of practice hire people like people who <clears throat> had practiced law, maybe they were judges, got tired of judging, want to do something else. Um, but, and that's a very different, those are people with very different experiences from... <clears throat> Would their ratings go down from U.S. News and World Report? Because wouldn't these people be less apt to publish fewer publications, they yes. get lower rankings? That's right. And U.S. News doesn't give them any credit for bringing in people who are, who are better at training them how to be litigators and trial lawyers. Would that be true? I think that's true. I, okay. I'm not. What would those courses look like um, at the law school that would now be taught by practitioners and would now be different and better for the practicing litigators, trial lawyers? It's like evidence. How would they teach evidence differently? Well, they would try to make the courses as good a, a mirror of the actual practice as they could, um, which is entirely feasible. You can teach an evidence course by having the students play the different roles in a trial, jurors, judge, lawyers, witnesses. And that would be instructive as an aside, playing judge. You mentioned that in your book. It's a very important thing for students to experience what it's like to be a judge. Yes, I tried when I taught an evidence course like that. I I tried to get the law the the law students to to be the ju judges, the judge as well as the uh, lawyers and the jurors and witnesses. But they were adamant I had to be the judge. They wanted you there. <laughs> they just didn't trust me one of them in that role. So part, so part of judging is learning how to be collegial, learning how to be collaborative. Would that be true? Especially if you're on the Circuit Court of Appeals where you're, you're hearing cases in threes. Right. You're deciding them in threes. You're writing opinions. You can have a concurring or dissenting opinion, but often in threes. So you, need, you have to learn how to work as a group to some extent. Yes. For the Court of Appeals, of which there are 13 for folks just made clear, we're talking mostly about federal courts. For those folks who don't focus right. on, on this, you know, the world in the United States is divided into state courts and federal courts. 
Judge Posner's on the Circuit Court of Appeals. Federal courts are divided into, there's the Supreme Court, they're the Supremes. Then there are 13 courts of appeals that number, is it about 100, is it 150 judges on total in the courts of appeals? About active um, judges? It's about 200. 200. Yeah. Okay, 13 courts of appeals. You've got the 11 circuits. You've got the D.C. circuit. You've got the Fed circuit. Okay, then you've got these district courts, which are part of the federal court system. But my point was, we're just here focusing on the federal court system. And so, okay. So you, you remark that you have, some of the circuits are less collegial. Yeah. The judges don't get along as well. That can be a problem if you have to sit on the same panel. So it's important. It sounds silly for some who focus on theory. If you go to law school, that some, and I might have been one of those, you know, you think back, uh, you know, it's all about law, it's all about economics and so forth. But in reality, if you want to be a trial lawyer, if you want to be a litigator, you might, ought to, and you want to be a judge, you ought to know something about getting along with people. And, and the law schools can actually teach that? No. They can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't matter. The, uh, one of the great f federal judiciary is badly administered. And an example of this is this collegiality problem. All that you need to deal with the collegiality in the courts of appeals, so Sixth Circuit, Ninth Circuit, uh, is until fairly recently the D.C. Circuit had very serious collegiality problems. All that the Chief Justice of the United States, who's supposed to be the head of the entire federal judiciary, all he had to do, summon those judges to Washington, tell them, cut out this childish stuff, get along with each other, that would end the problem. That would? Immediately. Really? Absolutely. If the Chief Justice Five said that. Five minutes, yeah. yes. Yeah. They never do that because the chief justices are not, are not good administrators. They're not appointed for their administrative skills. They don't exhibit the administrative chief judge skills. for each circuit. No, I'm talking about the chief justice. Just, oh, the chief, and the yeah. chief justice for the Supreme Court. Yeah, the chief yeah. judge isn't going to get very far <laughs> telling his judges or her oh, judges. Oh, so you're saying the chief justice, he referred to the chief judge. So you're saying, yeah, about the chief, to, the, if you have a circuit yeah, where you have Roberts, these problems, yeah. Roberts is not just the chief justice for the Supreme Court. He's really right. over He's the head all, of the entire judiciary. He could just call up somebody at the Seventh Circuit well, and I say, straight call him up. up. I would, would go bring see him, him to Washington. Bring him to Washington. I'd drag chew them into him into my office, yeah. and I'd chew him out, and that would be the end of it. And he never does that? No. And nobody's ever done that as chief justice. Not in modern do times. A <laughs> No, I think in the olden days they got together. They got along better. Okay. So, like, if uh, Roberts were watching this and he would see you telling him to do it, do you think he might do it? Because no. you, why? He's not a good administrator. He's he's not going to be persuaded that's a part of his job and something he should do. It's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. Okay. I mean, the Supreme Court is is not being well administered, nor is the rest of the federal judiciary. In fact, there's very little. What's Overall what's the worst thing that they're in terms Pardon? of what's the worst aspect of the administration in the Supreme Court? Um, well, I don't know if I, if I can pick out a worst, <laughs> a single worst. Just um, a few. Uh, they don't they don't give enough time for oral argument. They talk too much at the oral argument. That's connected. If they gave more time, then they could babble away, but at least mm -hmm. the lawyers would have some time to talk. Instead, they've, they've cut the time about 50% over some earlier period, well, when I was a law clerk there in the Solicitor General's office. And, um, and they just talk much more, the Supreme Court justices. And as a result, these arguments are unsatisfactory. Um, that's, that's one thing that's bad. There's some things that are just ridiculous. So next to each uh, uh, seat of Supreme Court justice on their bench, you know, the nine, nine chairs, the nine justices, next to each one is a spittoon, brass spittoon. 
been there probably for a hundred years. Now that is ridiculous. The spittoon has vanished. Nobody does. No. Not too much spitting. <laughs> and not so much anymore. In World War II, the government seized all the spittoons <laughs> that they could find. Well, sure, in the that's United not States. that can't be too much of a problem. It may be an irritant to you, but why is it so a, awful that there's because a spittoon I don't. There? What I do not like about what I most dislike about the federal, well, the entire American judiciary and legal system is always looking backwards, always going backwards. What are they doing with these spittoons? I assume they would In say World it's War II, part of the tradition. In World War II, the United yeah. States, okay. the federal government, they seized all the spittoons and melted them down because they're brass, and brass is used for uh, bullet casings. That was the end of the spittoon, except the Supreme Court and Congress have these stupid spittoons. Now, I don't like this stuff. But we'll so going back to the book, because you just mentioned, you know, one of the things that bothers you, people are always looking back. Yes. And when you talk in the book, uh, as part of the issue uh, between the difference between the judiciary and the academic world, there is this issue of formalism versus realism. And so succinctly, formalism is generally what's taught in the law schools as to the way the law works. Would that be correct? Yes. And that's a system that says, we've got precedent. We have a research system. When you've got a problem, figure out what the issue is. We've set the system up in Westlaw and other aspects where you can easily find if there's a precedent that is a case that's similar with a holding on point, go to that and you sort of get into the matter that way. Have I sort of described it, formalism? Yeah, you have the Constitution and its amendments. You have statutes. The you have administrative yeah. regulations. Okay. Nobody, I, well, I'll tell you about that in a second. <laughs> and you have precedents, which are just you know judicial decisions. Yeah. You have a lot of paper. And the formalist, well, there's a it's called the traditional style of legal analysis, is to find the answers to a current case in some of these, in this body of documents. That's the traditional. But uh, the realist says, that's old stuff, and you can't solve problems with old documents. The framers of the Constitution, although they were intelligent people, they didn't foresee electronic surveillance. They didn't foresee same-sex marriage, right? So you're not going to find anything in the Constitution dealing with these problems. And it's true with precedents, regulations, statutes. They typically did not foresee the issues that have arisen. And therefore, you can't interpret, when we talk about interpretation, interpretation means trying to identify an original meaning. Someone wrote something, said something, and the question is, what did that person mean? Well, very often, what that person meant has absolutely nothing to, what, to do with what modern people are concerned with. You can't find anything in the Constitution of, you know, 1789 about electronic surveillance. So why would you think that if you have a problem with electronic surveillance, you go back to the Fourth Amendment? Hey. You don't think the Fourth Amendment helps you at all in that? No. If you read it, you wouldn't even read the Fourth Amendment if you were dealing with a <laughs> search and seizure problem? I mean, if you hadn't read it in a while, you don't think it would help you to have read it? Or ever? Do you think you should? Should you start it all with the Fourth Amendment in your analysis? Well, it depends what the analysis is. The, the only thing, actually, that's... So what the Fourth Amendment says is that searches and seizures, searches and arrests, have to be uh, reasonable. <laughs> that's totally empty. It's, it's, it, it says, okay, it says... It, it, the right of the people to be secure in their persons' houses, pers persons and effects, 
against unreasonable searches and seizures, un against unreasonable searches and seizures, shall not be violated, right. and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause. So it does tell us the search has to be reasonable. Number two, you need a warrant. No, it doesn't say you need a warrant. Absolutely not. Oh, it, but it says, it says, it says and no warrant shall issue but, right. upon, but upon probable There's cause. A, yeah, so people, but people think it's implicit in there. No, it is not implicit. I know, but, but why, it but is people, not do think, I don't care what they think. Yeah, you don't care. It's okay. not implicit. The only thing, the only uh, reference to warrants in the Fourth Amendment is to place restrictions on warrants. There is nothing to say that there's nothing to say that you have to have a warrant ever. So somebody who might be running for president, like Ted Cruz, and might say, you know, if you want to go and do these things and engage in this surveillance, follow the Constitution, go get a warrant. You know? No, they'd be wrong. They might say that, but they would be wrong. wrong. Yeah. Okay. So there's just nothing. Even if you look beyond the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. There's nothing in precedent, at least back they 100 didn't years like ago. Warrants. They didn't like warrants. Okay. They didn't like warrants because the English, you know... But it I came up somehow. No, we look. The, no. Well, do we the, issue warrants now? Look, listen to me. Okay. The, when, when, you know, before the revolution, <laughs> um, the Americans were very upset about taxes, right, imposed by England like the, the stamp tax and taxes on tea. Right. So what they tried to do was to, what they, they would hide <laughs> the tea and so on from the, uh, from the British tax collectors. And so the, so the British would use what are called general warrants to enter these warehouses and take back the tea. What the, what the what the Fourth Amendment does is place limits on warrants. It doesn't authorize, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything about whether there ever should be warrants. It's just that if there are warrants, they have to comply with these restrictions. Probable cause, oath, and it can't be a general warrant. It has to specify, you know, exactly what you're looking for. So that is formalism, and I'm, people didn't realize, so I was like reading from the Fourth Amendment, throwing the Fourth Amendment's exact words back at the judge, and you're saying, in the process of doing that, you taught me that it doesn't quite say what people often say right. it says. That's it right. does basically say, if you're going to do a search or seizure, it has to be reasonable, and you're saying that's fairly empty in terms of yes. providing guidance. And that's your criticism, in part, of formalism, is that there's not real guidance as to how to resolve the problem. Yeah, old right? documents aren't going to tell you how to deal with You're problems. saying your view is this, this thing, the U.S. Constitution, is an old document? Well, I mean, it is much of it is old. Of course, there have been amendments, what? some of them important, like the 14th Amendment. But uh, most of the constitutional provisions that are still referred to go back to the Bill of Rights of 1791 and then the original Constitution of 1789. But the, there's a doctrine that has evolved in interpreting these amendments, which is sort of the common law of constitutional law. Would that be correct? Yeah, well, there's a professor at University of Chicago, David Strauss, who, who has argued, I think, very persuasively that really what the courts do with the Constitution, they treat it as authorization for a common law of rights and restrictions and so on. And they're not really looking at what the Constitution said. They're just looking at the, looking at, um, the, the breadth and the formlessness <laughs> of the Constitution and saying, uh, well, this means, you know, like we have a free speech clause. So we'll decide what kind of expression, we the justices or judges, we'll decide what kind of expression we think should be embraced by the term free speech. 
So like burning the American flag, right? That's now thought to be protected by the free speech clause as long as it's your own flag. And uh, obviously you can't get that out of the free speech clause in the First Amendment. You ask yourself, what would, a, what would 18th century people think about someone who wanted to burn the national flag in order to express dislike of the government? What would they think of that? They wouldn't say, oh, that's free speech. That's ridiculous. You can't allow that. Right. But, okay, and, but you've, you've agreed, and Strauss has pointed out, that there is sort of, there is this doctrine that has been, would you say, judge created, yeah, which is judge common created. law. Yeah. So there's it's this body of, of there's this body of law yeah, called constitutional absolutely. law. And is that part of formalism? Or is that part of being a realist when you no, resort to looking at that? No, I think that's part of being realist. I mean, realist. The, the it's not a part of formalism. Realist, yeah, the Constitution, when treated as a authorization to judges to create a body of principles you know, designed to um, achieve what are believed to be important ends, that's fine. There's no objection to that. It's just not interpretation, right? It's not finding some original meaning and saying, oh yeah, the frame is the Constitution. They wanted people to be allowed to burn their flags. That's ridiculous. But in any case, so this formalism does make use of this constitutional law, this doctrine. You would say that's more realism than formalism, but some might differ with you and say that's part of that. But going to being a realist, or the realist as opposed to a formalist, do you think it's, it sounds like you're saying in the book, you don't really need to focus on precedent, you don't need to focus on cases. When you got a problem, look at the facts, kind of figure out what makes sense, right. what common sense is. Somebody you knew, my Professor George Stigler was fond of saying, yes, but who's, when you'd say use common <laughs> sense. But we'll, we'll, won't get distracted by that. Um, so, but that's the approach you seem to champion in the book, this practical approach, figuring out what makes sense. Don't look right. back, look forward. In the economist jargon, don't look at sunk costs, look future incremental costs uh, and benefits. And then ask yourself, if you decide it this way, will there be any great harm done to right. legal uncertainty, to the Constitution, to something else? And if there is some great conflict, well, then maybe you should back off. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, well, one thing just to add would be you want to be con concerned about reliance interests. So there may be some bad rule or bad decision, but the people affected by it, they've adjusted to it. And if you, and if you change the rule, it would just cause confusion and expense and it's just not worth doing it.